Okay, so the first step. All right, welcome everyone. Happy to see so many people here uh, in the auditorium. But also, there must be more than 100 people online, which is a bit strange, of course, uh, to, to see, not to see people, but they see us. So uh, also welcome the people uh, online. Um, today, we have a, a very special guest. Uh, it's the new director of the Rembrandt Association, uh, who started in the 1st of July this year, 2022. Uh, he followed uh, Fusine Bell de Vries, de Vriel, who did it for 22 years, the job, so, uh, so it's quite a responsibility. Uh, before uh, working in the Rembrandt Association, Geert Jan Janssen worked in the Taylor's Museum, where he did, was responsible for research and policy, and then went abroad, working in Beijing, Paris, to, to become the secretary of the uh, Dutch Collection Committee, kind of a institute to protect important cultural heritage here in uh, the Netherlands. Geert Jan, thank you very much for being here. The floor is yours. Thank you. Um, thank you, Stan, for the introduction. Uh, and thank you very much for the opportunity to speak here tonight on the Rembrandt Association, or Vereniging Rembrandt, as it is called in Dutch. Um, I want to tell you something tonight about our history, the history of the Rembrandt Association, uh, why we were founded, uh, and what our contribution has been to Dutch public collections. Um, I am going to speak in English most of the time, but this first slide shows a quote, a, a saying we often use at the association, niets is er zomaar. It's difficult to translate, but it means something as nothing is self-evident or, or should be taken for, for granted. And of course, that's something that is true for many aspects in life, but it is also in, uh, specifically true for what we can see today in Dutch museums. This is a picture of, the, of four very famous paintings by Vermeer in the Gallery of Anna at the Rijksmuseum in Amsterdam. Um, and what we see today in Dutch museums um, has never been, is, is not the result of a preconceived plan. It is the result of a very capricious um, historical process uh, of which the outcome uh, was never certain. Uh, so it is a story of successes, but it's also a story of missed opportunities um, and most of what we see today in the Dutch museums previously was part of private collections. And compared to other countries, compared to Germany or to France, the Netherlands, the Dutch Republic, has a very specific history, collecting history, because we never had a, a, a very strong or continuous tradition of royal or noble uh, collections. And what was very typical for the Dutch Republic was that art was collected by all classes in, in society. So there were a lot of private collections um, and in, at the same time art was also always seen as a commodity. Uh, so as something to be sold and to, to trade in. Um, there were already in the 18th uh, century famous auctions in Amsterdam and The Hague and many Dutch artworks <coughs> spread around Europe after being sold at one of these auctions. And I wanted to start with this picture because all Vermeer paintings in, uh, the, uh, in the collection of the Rijksmuseum are there uh, because of private collectors. Uh, for instance, this painting, Woman Reading a Letter, was for a long time part of a, a collection of an Amsterdam banker, Van der Hoop. And in 1854, it was bequeathed to the city of Amsterdam, but the council initially uh, was not very uh, positive because they did not want to pay the inheritance tax. So fortunately, there were some private individuals in Amsterdam who stepped in, who paid for the inheritance tax. And so this collection, this important collection of, of Van der Hoop, 
uh, was preserved for Amsterdam. Not only this famous painting, but for instance also uh, uh, Rembrandt's uh, Jewish Bride was also part of this collection. The Love Letter by Johannes Vermeer, painting was acquired in 1892 from a, um, a private Amsterdam collection uh, with support uh, of the Vereniging Rembrandt, the Rembrandt Association. The Milkmaid, again acquired from an old Amsterdam collection in 1908, and again with uh, support of the association. And this painting, view of houses in Delft, known as the Little Street, was bequeathed to the museum in 1921. Part of um, what happened with these private collections is that from roughly 1850 onwards, there was an enormous exodus of collections being sold, collections who often, uh, um, after being sold at auction, left the Netherlands forever. Uh, a famous example is the private collection of Kim King William II, who you see here in a portrait by Jan Adam Kruseman. Um, after his death, um, his collection was sold at auction because he was and there was a significant debt, uh, but his collection contained paintings by very famous international artists such as Bellini, Rubens, Van Dijk, Perugino, Quercino. Uh, um, non, not one of these paintings was acquired by the Dutch state at that point, um, and it are all artists that afterwards um, have never been present in Dutch collections, uh, or at least not at the level they were represented in, uh, uh, in, in his collection. Um, in the 1850s and afterwards, the Dutch government uh, really was of the opinion, uh, the famous saying by the Dutch liberal statesman uh, Johan Rudolf Thorbecke, often seen as the founding father of Dutch democracy, that government is no judge of art and should conduct a policy of neutrality in this field, which also meant no acquisitions for public collections. To show you a few examples of the Dutch masterpieces, previously in the collection of King William II and sold at auction in 1850, for example, this Annunciation by Jan van Eyck, which ended up in the National Gallery of Art in Washington, where it can still be seen today. And also this fabulous portrait of Rembrandt, portrait of Nicolaas Rutz, which ended up in the Frick Collection in New York. From the 1870s onwards, uh, a lot of private collections, mainly private collections in Amsterdam, came to the market. Um, in Amsterdam, it was um, a success to, to preserve the collection van der Hoop for Amsterdam, but similar, uh, a similar attempt in the city of Rotterdam failed miserably. Uh, collection Vis Blockhuizen, who in 1869 was uh, bequeathed to the city, but refused by the council, again, because they did not want to pay the inheritance tax. Entire collection was sold at auction, among which this painting, The Lace uh, Maker by Vermeer, and it was acquired by the Louvre for uh, 3,600 guilders at the time. Not only paintings left the Netherlands in this period, but also architectural elements. And a famous example is this rot, uh, root screen, I think is the term in, in English, from St. Jan's Cathedral in Den Bosch by Hendrik de Keijzer. Uh, which in 1866 was demolished uh, and sold, and uh, since 1871 on view at the Victorian Albert Museum in London, where it can still be seen today. And perhaps the most famous example, these two portraits by Rembrandt, Martin and Opium, uh, who were part of a very famous Amsterdam collection, collection von Loon von Winter, uh, collection that was also on view in Amsterdam, so 
in many aspects were seen as a public collection at the time. Uh, but in 1878, the entire collection was sold to the Rothschild uh, family. Uh, and these paintings left Amsterdam, left the Netherlands, and in 2016 were acquired uh, by the Dutch state and the Republic of France and are now on view either at the Rijks Museum or the Louvre in Paris. So against this background of all these private collections being sold off uh, and disappearing to, to uh, collections abroad, um, some people felt the need for action. And this is especially true for someone who we owe a great deal of gratitude to, Victor de Steurs. He is the small, rather small man you see on the left, and the, the other man sitting in the chair is Pierre Kuipers, the architect. And very often when they are pictured together, uh, Victor de Steurs is pictured standing because he was a rather small man and Pierre Kuipers was a very large man. Um, he wrote a very famous article, comment mainly, on, on this cultural policy or lack of cultural policy in the Netherlands called Holland op zijn smallst, which was published in the Gids in 1873. And he wrote, and I'm going to quote this in Dutch, on the, the, the screen now on view at the, at the V&A in London, uh, ik kon bijna niet geloven, when he was in London to visit this museum, dat hetgeen ik zag in werkelijkheid voor mij stond. He felt humiliated and he also was afraid that someone would come up to him and ask him if he was a Dutchman. Um, at the time, and this is very important to, to realize, Dutch museums had no budget whatsoever. Around this time, the, the annual budget of the Mauritshuis, for example, was 800 guilders. Um, and it could only be used for maintenance of the collection and not for acquisition. Victor de Steurs and a group of Amsterdam collectors, private collectors, art lovers, united themselves in 1883 to, um, to preserve treasures, national treasures for the Netherlands. And they founded what they call the Vereniging tot Behoud in Nederland van Kunstschatten Rembrandt. Um, they, they chose Rembrandt because it was, of course, a very nationalist idea that he was the biggest and most important Dutch artist who had ever lived. And in their opinion, and again, this is, of course, a very 19th century idea, but in their opinion, he was also a sort of objective benchmark for quality. So what better name than Rembrandt for such an, uh, a new association? In the early days of the association, the main focus was preservation and return, preservation of, of art treasures in the Netherlands, uh, preserve them for Dutch public collections, and return of important paintings who had already left the country. And a specific and concrete uh, 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 reason why these Amsterdam collectors, art lovers, united themselves was the auction of a very famous collection of drawings by Jacob de Vos. You see him, uh, you see him depicted here in a portrait by Nicolaas Pieneman at the Rijksmuseum in Amsterdam a collector who had um, um, amassed a collection of uh, 1,300 sheets of old master drawings, uh, many dozens of, of Rembrandt drawings, um, and his collection, again, was being sold at auction. The association, the newly founded association, uh, made available a budget of 50,000 guilders to acquire works of art drawings at this auction. And again, if you compare 50,000 guilders to the 800 guilders as annual budget in more or less the same period of the Mauritshuis, you get an idea of the 
sort of enormous scale of what was going on here. Um, and with this 50,000 guilders, uh, it was possible to acquire 200 lots at this auction. Um, they were all made available to the Rijksbrente Cabinet, the Rijksmuseum. Um, and many of those sheets are still considered masterpieces and very crucial central sheets in this collection. Uh, and it's very interesting to see that the, the lot numbers they wanted to buy were all, to a large extent, was a very, again, nationalist uh, approach to what they thought was very important to preserve at this point for the Netherlands. Uh, so it were pieces, drawings, who had a particular relation to, to, to Dutch history, for instance, and drawings who had a more purely artistic quality were much cheaper also at this auction. Um, this is a famous drawing by Rembrandt, part of that collection. And to show you also one of those more artistic drawings, which drawings were now appreciated enormously also because of their quality, this a beautiful drawing by Hendrik Holtzius of a monkey was relatively cheap at that auction because it, there was no connection to Dutch history. It was a purely artistic uh, uh, drawing. Shortly afterwards, and this is one of the Vermeer paintings I started my story with, um, there was another auction in Amsterdam and this Vermeer came to the market. It was acquired with uh, support of, of this newly founded association. They paid 41,000 guilders, but the permanent threat was this was acquired. Collection von Loon, the two Martin and Opie portraits had been sold. What would happen if the most famous collection in Amsterdam, the Collection 6, would also be auctioned? So this was the permanent threat in, at, at that time. The association had to be ready, had to accumulate funds to be prepared for a possible auction of the Collection 6. To show you an example of the uh, uh, variety of objects that were um, uh, supported in this early period by the association, this is a reliquary bust. Uh, it's actually the first medieval, important medieval object that was acquired for a Dutch public collection. It is a bust that was for a very long time uh, uh, part of a relic in one of the churches at Utrecht. It had survived the Reformation and it ended up uh, uh, somewhere at a dealer, uh, uh, antique dealer in Paris where it was spotted by Victor de Steurs. And as some of you might know, Victor de Steurs was not only very interested in medieval art, but also uh, uh, felt strongly connected to, to uh, Catholic past, to, to the Catholic heritage of the Netherlands. So this was the kind of object he, he simply could not resist. Uh, so it was supported by, by the association um, and can now be seen at the Rijksmuseum. This is a landscape by Rembrandt. Rembrandt did not paint a lot of landscapes. Um, and it is actually the first painting by Rembrandt that was um, um, acquired by the Rijksmuseum. Because the three paintings by Rembrandt that were on view at the Rijksmuseum in 1885, when the museum opened, were all permanent loans of the city of Amsterdam. This painting was acquired in 1900. Um, again, with uh, a support of the association, but in this case, also support by the Dutch state and support by uh, uh, some private indi individuals. Um, also, for instance, uh, Abraham Brady is the famous uh, Rembrandt scholar. The milkmaid uh, was part uh, of a... Uh, um, branch of the collection six that ended up uh, at a, uh, by marriages and inheritances um, in a different part of the family. And in 1905 uh, was for sale, came up for sale. 
uh, 39 paintings were offered by uh, um, a member of the Six family for the enormous amount of 750,000 guilders. Um, and I show you this again because in 1905 there was a lot of discussion about whether or not to buy this painting. Uh, for instance, someone as Fritz Lucht, very famous art historian, was very skeptical, very critical. Uh, he thought it was too expensive. He thought this was an important painting, but the other 38 were hardly of any importance. So there was a, a, a strong debate about whether or not to, to, to support this acquisition. It was supported, luckily, I think we can say, look, looking back, um, and uh, acquired for the Rijksmuseum. Briefly, to show you that it is not only private collections from Amsterdam coming to the market, but also uh, elsewhere in, in The Hague. Uh, it was a very famous collection, collection uh, Steengracht, uh, was assembled uh, by the Steengracht van Oostkapelle family over a few generations, and it had been on view, public view, in The Hague since uh, 1823. Um, and again, considered more or less as part of our public uh, art collections. But in 1913, it was brought to auction uh, and auctioned in Paris. Um, this painting was acquired for the Maurits House, where it can still be seen today, by Gerard ter Borg, um, with support of the Rembrandt Association. Same applies to this famous painting by Jan Steen, But not all paintings from this collection were uh, preserved for the Netherlands. This is uh, um, a painting by Rembrandt, not his best painting, I think. It's um, uh, Beth uh, Sheba, and it was acquired for one million francs, um, which was, at the time, the world record for an old master. And, and well, if you take into consideration that only this week, I think, there was a new record for a Mondrian painting of over 50 million and, well, uh, um, taking into account what you currently have to pay for, for a, a, a work by Rembrandt, um, it shows that also in that aspect there's been a very long development. Um, it was acquired at this auction by De Wien, uh, a famous art dealer, and, and relatively soon afterwards uh, bequeathed by an American collector to the Metropolitan Museum, where it can still be seen today. In the early days, the Rembrandt Association supported acquisitions mainly for the Rijksmuseum, but also, as I showed you, for the Maurits House. Uh, uh, this is an example of a painting by Hieronymus Bos, the peddler, uh, which came to the market to uh, in the 1930s. Uh, in a collection in, in Vienna. Uh, and again, this is an example of, of not only trying to preserve national treasures, but also uh, trying to, to reacquire them if they come to the market somewhere abroad. So this was uh, acquired uh, for Museum Boymans van Bernia in Rotterdam. So from 1920 onwards, there is a different approach, although there is, it is sort of two uh, approaches consisting next to each other for some time. There is the continuous effort to, to preserve national treasures who come to the market, but there is also uh, the, uh, uh, a new approach um, trying to, to strengthen the Dutch public collections, not only by uh, acquisitions of Dutch art, but also uh, more uh, a more international focus. And in this period, 1922, um, this portrait by Goya, uh, for example, is acquired by the Rijksmuseum and supported by the association. Uh, and also, and it's really only from the 19, 1920s, 1930s onwards, uh, Asian art. Uh, and this beautiful statue by, uh, of Shiva Nataraya, uh, which 
still is one of the masterpieces of the collection of Asian art at the Rijksmuseum, uh, was acquired in 1935 uh, with uh, a support of the association. Same applies to this statue of Guan Yin. Um, after World War II, there is a, a, a third approach and uh, basically consists um, of the uh, long discussion within the association whether or not to support acquisitions of contemporary art. Um, a very early example is this work by Matthijs Maris, which was acquired in 1906 for Museum Boymans from Birmingham. It was the first example of a more or less contemporary work supported by the by the association, but it was also for a very long time the only example. Um, uh, this painting by Marc Chagall, a very important painting in his oeuvre, uh, was acquired by the Van Abbe Museum in 1951, and it was the first really uh, uh, contemporary uh, uh, um, uh, support given by, by the uh, association. And that was something that was also hotly debated. Uh, so in the end, the, the board had to vote on this. And there were six vo votes in favor and, and five uh, against. Uh, and uh, again, I'm, I'm going to quote something in Dutch. One of the board members at the time said, in the toekomst zou men dit werk van Chagall wel eens als een zeer belangrijke aankoop kunnen beschouwen beschouwen, ook al zijn thans zeer velen niet geneigd aan deze kunstuiting enige waarde toe te kennen. Um, I think he was not entirely convinced himself, but uh, <laughs> um, this discussion took some, some years because uh, um, before finally uh, the, the association decided that it was of great importance also to support contemporary works of art, uh, also from the idea that they could be uh, formative in, in, in uh, uh, forming a new modern society. A uh, famous example is this uh, cutout by Henri Matisse uh, at the Stedelijk Museum in Amsterdam, but also at the same museum, this work by Barnett Newman. Uh, so I wanted to show you now briefly some more recent uh, uh, acquisitions from, uh, supported by the association, also to, to, to illustrate the, the, the great range and diversity of works of art supported by, by the association. Uh, this lacquer chest, uh, acquired in 2013 by the Rijksmuseum. Um, this statue by Adrian de Vries, which very famous Dutch sculptor who up until 2014 was not part in, of any Dutch public collection with a very significant work. So when this came to auction, it was really a once in a lifetime opportunity. Uh, um, and with generous support of the association, this was acquired by the Rijksmuseum. Uh, a beautiful screen here in Leiden at Museum Volkenkunde uh, which shows the, the Bay of Nagasaki and the island of Deshima, uh, but also uh, this painting by Constable for the Rijksmuseum Twente, two flower pyramids for Kunstmuseum De Haag, uh, a beautiful tapestry, I think, is, is what describes it perhaps best by El Anatsui uh, for the Stedelijk Museum in Amsterdam, supported in 2020 artist from Ghana, uh, of course, also the standard bearer by uh, Rembrandt, currently on, on tour uh, through the Netherlands. You can visit and see it now at the Maurits House, um, acquired by the, by the Dutch state uh, uh, and very generous support of the association, 15 million euros, was the, by far the the most significant uh, uh, support ever granted to, to a single acquisition. Uh, but also, more, even more recently, this painting by Miro for the Museum Boymans in Amsterdam. 
not only very significant and important uh, um, uh, acquisitions for large museums, but also smaller acquisitions for often smaller institutions, but equally significant. Uh, one example we often show is this uh, Karev by Andries Kopier uh, for the Glasmuseum in Leerdam. So the uh, Rembrandt Association supports acquisitions uh, uh, um, throughout sort of the, the entire range from, from antiquity to contemporary art for the, the larger institutions but also the, the smaller museums. Um, I think a very interesting example is uh, a recent example is this view of uh, Reinen by Jan van Gooyen, uh, which was acquired by the newly founded Stadsmuseum in Reinen and supported by the uh, association. So I have shown you something about these different approaches since the founding of the association. First, mainly focused on preservation and return of national treasures, and then from the 1920s onwards, sort of broader approach to, to trying to, to, to strengthen the Dutch public collections to after World War II, also a, a broad support of contemporary art. Now, on a more practical level, I wanted to tell you something about the application process. And I wanted to do that by focusing on uh, uh, this acquisition, again, for a museum here at Leiden, for the Rijksmuseum van Oudheden. This is a ceremonial sword uh, known as the, the Sword of Ommerschans. Um, and it is a, it's a very large uh, uh, sword and dates from uh, around 1500 BC. So it's, it's from the Bronze Age. Um, and for over a century, the museum uh, um, had wanted to acquire this piece. Um, and in 2017, it came up at auction. So how does this work? I apologize because the text is in, in Dutch, but it all starts with the museum. So the museum uh, notices this very important object is for sale, comes up for auction, um, sends in an application for, for a grant to, to the association. And this is a very, I mean, this really is a, uh, uh, um, uh, they have to supply a lot of information. So the, the, it's not a single sheet of paper. It is a lot of extra information. Then the board of the association asks an independent expert, one or two, to, to advise on, on this uh, uh, grant application, their advice and the application are discussed in a board meeting by the board and then um, at these meetings, whenever possible, the works of art are present so they can be seen in person by the board members and they can discuss about them. Um, and um, during this meeting, board decides whether or not to support uh, uh, this acquisition and decides on the amount of support uh, to, um, to give to, to this museum. So in this case, uh, it was a significant uh, uh, amount because it was such an important object and supported by this grant, the museum could uh, bid at auction and was successful in acquiring this enormous sword for Leiden. Um, briefly, something about our organizational structure. So the uh, Vereniging Rembrandt really is a foundation. So we have 17,000 members. Uh, we have a yearly general meeting uh, of members. We have a board of directors of 12 people, 12 board members, 11 non-executive directors and one executive director, general director. Um, so that, that's me. Uh, decision, the, the board decides on grants, then there is a board of advisors, uh, 33 people currently, they advise on, on art historical matters, uh, also on judicial questions and, and questions of philanthropy. We also have uh, what we call the bureau, 22 people, that's the daily running of the organization, so finances, 
marketing, communication, administration. Um, and the sources of income are the yearly contribution of these members, the 17,000 members. Um, we have 10 what we call circles, so groups of members who have united themselves um, and often contribute uh, significantly more than the, the normal yearly contribution. Uh, we also receive inheritances um, and we're very lucky to, uh, to receive also uh, support of, for instance, the Prince Bernard Culture Fonds on a yearly basis since the 1960s and more recently also from the Vriendenloterij. So we try to uh, uh, strengthen these partnerships as well. Um, nowadays, it is still support for acquisitions, but also uh, uh, support for research and restoration. Um, show you two recent examples in this slide. And this is all from the idea that object-based, collection-based research, connoisseurship is very important uh, and is something that uh, um, for, for some time has been a tendency to, to, to approach and to teach art history and history uh, in a more theoretical way. And of course it is of great importance to, uh, to offer new perspectives on, on our public collections and what is included in them and, and what is missing. Um, there never is only one perspective on, on our public collections and, uh, um, and they are continuously in development but we, are, we firmly believe that also if you want to tell a new story it always starts with a very thorough knowledge of the object itself. Uh, so that is why by offering research grants for instance we always try to uh, um, focus and to ask attention for this uh, a vein of more object-based research. Um, challenges for the future. Um, I think a very important challenge for the kind of association we are is to keep the community spirit alive, the, the verenigingsgevoel, as we would say in Dutch, passing it on to, to a next generation. Uh, on a more practical level also supplementing funds after all these very ambitions, uh, ambitious acquisitions that have been done over the last few years. Um, another point of, of uh, interest and actually also concern is the, the role of, of government. Um, here in the Netherlands, uh, the government or the state, the Dutch state, contributes to acquisitions through what is called the Museal Aankoopfonds, but this is a fund that is not uh, uh, significantly uh, uh, funded and, and not on a structural basis, um, which means uh, the, the role of the Dutch state uh, in, in acquisitions is, is limited somewhat. Um, and on the other hand, we try to lobby for, for fiscal measures to, to strengthen patronage from private donors. Um, a more fundamental question, uh, and perhaps a good question also for, for after this talk, is uh, what the future is for, for collecting for and by Dutch museums. Because, as I've tried to show you also tonight, is that there is actually already so much uh, in Dutch collections. So I think there's also... A, a task and, and an opportunity to um, connect these different collections in a better way. Uh, for instance, some works of art in a specific collection are never on view and in, in another collection would be uh, very interesting for, for the public as well. So this is something we try to, uh, uh, we try to uh, uh, contribute to. Uh, my predecessor, uh, Fuzin Bel de Vroel, was also uh, um, given a fund uh, uh, to specifically for, for this, uh, what we call collectie mobiliteit, so to really look at how you can connect 
different collections in, in a better, better way. Um, and of course, there is always discussion. And, and wanted to show you this picture of a recent article in NRC uh, by Hans Hartog Jager. Um, it's a, uh, um, as you can see, the works of art he, he shows are all supported by uh, recent acquisitions, supported by, by the association. Um, there's a lot to be, there's a lot you can say about this, uh, this article. Uh, he focuses on, on, on some names of contemporary artists who, in his opinion, are worthy of, of uh, uh, support and neglected. One of those artists, just to give you an example, is Alan Gallagher, who, who actually is also uh, uh, supported uh, recently. Uh, a work of her has been acquired by Fries Museum, and this acquisition was supported by the Rijksmuseum. So, um, uh, just to show you that by using different examples, you can also tell a, a different story from what he, he focuses on in, in his article. But uh, uh, in a more general way, I think it's very, very good that uh, uh, by this kind of articles, uh, it, it also shows it is a very lively and active discussion uh, uh, we should conduct together. Uh, on what is the uh, uh, future of collecting for the Netherlands. Uh, this I've already shown you. Um, so, to conclude, I've tried to show you something of uh, um, basically the enormous catching up for, for Dutch public collections since 1883. Um, um, what I always find fascinating is to realize that when the Rijksmuseum was uh, open to the public in 1885, there were only nine paintings by Rembrandt in Dutch public collections. Nowadays, including the standard bearer, we have 42. Or actually, I think 43 if you count the, uh, the newly attributed painting in Museum Brady. So it, it shows you something of, of, of the scale of what has been done since 1883 uh, and also of the role of, of the Rembrandt Association in, in, in this field. I've showed you some of the shifts in, in, in emphasis in the history of our uh, association. Um, and I hope I've also shown you something of, of our current activities of, of this very broad support for both uh, uh, large and, and, and smaller institutions. Uh, so we, we um, uh, support research. Um, restorations, acquisitions, and we also share our expertise um, and often try to do that also with our members. Um, and that is something we can never do uh, alone. We, I mean, we really depend on our members, on, on, on our different partnerships to, to uh, uh, continue to support the Dutch public connections. And in this way, we try to make uh, uh, um, important works of art uh, available to the general public for now and for future generations. So, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Oh, I'm gonna stand here because otherwise oh. I hear myself. <laughs> thank you very much, Jert Jan, for this uh, very promising future site. Actually, uh, if there are questions, please think about it because I'm gonna tell my, I'm gonna ask my first question, and then it's uh, up to you, of course. But uh, this summer, uh, another member of the of the uh, Rembrandt Association, Hilbert Lutzma and I, Hilbert. were uh, together with, with students exploring uh, what is the the perfect acquisition, and you you asked it almost the whole time to everyone. So now we're going to put the question to, to you. Me. What mm. for you is the perfect acquisition? It's a very difficult question for me to answer because in, I'm um, one of the 12 board members, but when it comes to decisions on, on grants, what to support, I have no voting, uh, I have no vote. So it's, it's a difficult, difficult question for me to, to, uh, to answer. 
Um, and I think it is, perhaps the answer is also that it not, it's not necessarily an acquisition. It could also be, uh, as I've tried to point out, in, in, in thinking about new ways of, of, of connecting existing collections. Uh, I think there's also a lot to be done in that respect. Um, but of course, there are always important works of art coming to the market. It can be works that have been previously unknown, uh, but it can also be works of, of artists that previously have been very much underestimated. So, as I've tried to show, um, I think it's a very crucial notion that, this, that our public art collections are never, there's never one point where you can say they are, this is it, they are concluded. So, uh, it's perhaps not the answer you were hoping for, but more, more general answer. <laughs> All right, thank you. Are there questions here? Then I just let you think because I have already a second question. Mm. Where did it, because you, you showed us in a perfect way the triumphs of the uh, Rembrandt Vereniging in that way, the, the acquisitions uh, like the Matisse, uh, mm. that are really huge and very important works later onwards that that was proven to be so. But are there also points where it really went wrong, where, you, where the Rembrandt Vereniging <laughs> <laughs> paid enormous prices for a work of art which is now in the depot and will never ever be out of the depot? And what can we learn from that? Or mm. is it always a bit of trying to get a good work but never be sure if it really resists the time? I think that is, could be, well, um, perhaps the most famous example uh, in the Netherlands is, of course, the Han van Meegen, mm -hmm. Emma's Gangers, uh, a painting that fooled a lot of the connoisseurs at the time, and also to some extent the association, because it was also supported, um, which is, of course, is a, a warning to always... Um, Remember that even if, if, if everyone seems to agree on, on a certain work of art, sometimes future generations have, um, uh, are of a different opinion. Um, I think the main examples of, of where we missed out or, or Dutch public collections missed out are these instances where collections came to the market and, and already at an early stage, for instance, because of the rise of American collectors. It was simply just out of reach uh, uh, for Dutch collections. And I think that is a, a development that, that continues more or less up until this day. Uh, um, I mean, if you, uh, there is a beautiful portrait by uh, Beckman uh, coming to, to, to auction in, in Berlin in a few weeks time um, from his Amsterdam period. Uh, but I think the estimate is 30 to 50 million euros. So there is also a, a segment of the art market that is um, more or less out of reach for, for Dutch collections, public collections. Other questions? Because otherwise I'm the whole time questioning. <laughs> Could be close to you. Um, you very lucidly explain how um, the origin of the association was happened during a context of nationalism mm -hmm. and consequently uh, the supporting and collecting policies were in line with this idea of collecting the Dutch. Mm -hmm. um, what would you say is the, the sense of, of the contemporary collecting and supporting uh, I don't want to call it an agenda, but maybe Now, parameters. Nowadays, or yeah. or... yeah, now. Well, what's very important to realize is that it is always the museum that, that does an, an application for a grant. Right. So it's, it's uh, um, not the board, not the association. We, we, I mean, we do not collect ourselves. It is really the museum that does an application. So um, um, in that way, I think the kind of grants we get reflects the way museums collect currently. So, of course, there is a, a, a shift over time. Um, 
if there is an agenda, I, again, that, that really is um, more, I think, a question for the museums, because it is not, I mean, we do not have an agenda in the way that we, uh, uh, we feel that a, a specific type of, of art should be acquired more or less. It's, it's really the museums that, that apply for a grant, and then this grant is, is discussed, is, is also uh, um, by, discussed by the board and by these individual experts, independent experts. Um, so, um, of course, you see a, a shift, but this is more a shift in the way Dutch museums collect nowadays. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you for your talk. I would like to, uh, I think, ask a question more or less in the same area. Mm -hmm. So how do you take diversity, which is the buzzword at the moment, mm -hmm. uh, into account? Well, again, the, the, um, um, my first answer is that um, um, it is something, uh, it is the museums who, who apply for grants. So, of course, we see that uh, um, um, a different kind of grants are um, um, are, uh, are uh, uh, discussed now by, by the board. Um, diversity, I think, is very important. I think also very important not only in the kind of acquisitions that are supported, but also for, for us as an association, because as I tried to uh, uh, indicate, uh, our main aim is to, to share these works of art with as many people as possible by acquiring them for Dutch public collections. So um, I think also in that respect, it's very important to, to have a very good idea of the diversity of, of the, the current public. So it is also something that uh, uh, not only applies to acquisitions, but also more broadly to, to the way you, you, you function as an, as an organization and as an, an association. Um, and in terms of acquisitions, uh, um, if you look at recent acquisitions, for instance, this work by, by El Anatsui, for instance, it, it, this is a very different kind of work than c compared to, I don't know, 15 years ago. So in that, that way you see uh, um, the way museums collect nowadays reflected in the kind of grants uh, uh, um, um, discussed by the board. Sorry, I think it was very good how you showed the um, the different uh, focus um, points in the different policy periods of mm. the uh, association, starting with Dutch art, uh, trying trying uh, to return Dutch art to the to the Netherlands towards a more Euro European approach, uh, particularly Euro Euro European painting, towards a more global, uh, modern, contemporary art approach. Um, you also said that the association has 7,000 members now. 17. Uh, se 17, sorry. Um, is there a link between the change in policy and the um, influence of the members? Uh, in other words, does the focus of the uh, Rembrandt Association, is it related to the background of the members? It's a very interesting question. For a very long time, it was a, uh, uh, at least in the 19th century, it was more or less a, a sort of private initiative of a small group of, of Amsterdam collectors, art lovers. Um, and it is really of the past 10, 15 years that the, the association has also grown enormously in, in, in the amount of members we, we have. Um, I don't think it is something you see reflected in these earlier ships because, again, the association was much, much smaller then. I think it is something you, you see and could see more nowadays because uh, a lot of our members are collectors themselves. So we have very, I mean, when, when, when I meet our members, for instance, when, when there is a, a dinner for one of those circles, 
very lively discussions on, on, on what is collected and, and, and what should be supported and what should not be supported. Uh, uh, so they're very, they feel actively in, involved with our association and they, they, they also provide uh, in, input to us. So uh, yes, I think nowadays far more at least than, than in, in a previous uh, situation because it was a very small group of people back then. Yes, so thank you for your talk. You briefly touched upon the rising prices within the art world, and mm -hmm. I think maybe you can even speak about certain commercialization within the art world. And your association supports this to a certain extent because you um, make it possible for museums to pay such often mm -hmm. ridiculous prices for artworks nowadays. So I was wondering uh, where does this end and yes. how do you feel about this? Well, it, well, where does this end? That's a very good question. I think if someone has the answer, I'd be very interested to, to, to discuss that with you. But um, no, that, that's a very, uh, uh, I think that's a very good point. And I think it's always a very uh, um, difficult discussion also for our board, because if you would say, for instance, at a certain point, it simply is too expensive. Those prices are ridiculous. We just do not want to be involved with it anymore. It also means that a certain group of works of art uh, are more or less lost for public collections because it means you, you, you cannot acquire them for public collections anymore. So that is always the, the, the discussion and always the, uh, uh, the question I think board members also ask themselves. Well, I mean, it, is it something that is of such eminent importance that you want to make it available to, to as many people as possible for now and for future generations. And does that, uh, um, uh, is this a price you, you are prepared to, to pay for that? But, but I agree that, uh, of course, there is a point at, at which it becomes nearly impossible also to, to, to keep up with the, the prices and the, the, the level of, of auction prices, for instance. Thank you. Thank you very much for your lecture. Um, sometimes uh, museums also, yeah, ensemble. I don't know if mm -hmm. there's an English yes. word for that, but uh, they sell their collections uh, mm -hmm. or, part, or or artworks. Has this ever happened to works which are supported with, uh, um, huh. yeah, support from your fund from the association? If not, what would you think about it if that would happen? It's a very good question again. Um, when the museum receives a grant, it is that there is also a a, a contract they have to, to sign and part of that is that this work uh, for which the grant is supplied always has to be part of public art collections uh, um, so it even involves uh, if the specific institution at some point would, would cease to exist there is the obligation to make sure that this specific work is is uh, uh, um, given or, or on loan or whatever to, to, to a different public collection. So it, it is something that is really part of, of, of the, uh, uh, the rules of, of accepting a, a, a grant. Um, and it is also something we always keep an eye on. So if, if there is a, a threat of, of, of a work that's been supported being, being sold or, or, or of a museum uh, uh, um, disappearing, it, it is something we, we really keep uh, uh, a focus on. And we actively also uh, um, try to find a, a new uh, uh, place for, for, for such a work. Do not hope you're going to correct me now. No, not at all. <laughs> I thought just may have an interesting addition. I remember one example of a, a painting by Hobbema, mm. which was acquired with the support of the Remote Association for Maurits Huis in Hague, and it was given later by the Dutch state as a present to Canada. Yes. liberating our country. That's true. So there was a, mm -hmm. I, think, I think we That's true. tried to get some money. I don't know how, how what happened afterwards. It was decided by the state, yeah. in, yes, to, to, to give it as a sort of gift to the uh, Allied forces. Yeah. Thank 
you very much for the talk. It was nice to get this historical overview. I thought I'd end with a bit of a challenging question, and it's maybe good ah. to know it's after <laughs> seven, so there are no, okay. there's no live stream, there's <laughs> nothing online anymore. Yes. Uh, but following <laughs> from a uh, debate we had here last year, we did a Rembrandt trial with some of the teachers and the students debating mm -hmm. the new acquisition of the standard bearer, and yes. there were a lot of different points coming up, but I think one of, of the course. aspects we didn't focus on here yet and that we as teachers didn't really have an answer to, I thought I'd just ask you about mm -hmm. it because one of the things that we discussed is that during this acquisition and the acquisition of Martin and Opium, so three mm -hmm. really expensive <laughs> Rembrandt paintings that were Absolutely. acquired, they were all acquired for the Rijksmuseum in mm -hmm. recent years, while the director of the Rijksmuseum is one of your board members and mm -hmm. so a lot of students were surprised to hear that uh, because that appears to be a, somewhat of a conflict of interest, even though he may very well step out of the particular meeting. He does, um, he does. Yes. I was just wondering, uh, as to your uh, personal opinion in that respect, and maybe also more generally speaking, mm -hmm. um, about the pros and cons of having very active museum directors on the board versus maybe uh, people with a, a bit more distance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, that's a very good question. Uh, um, and if you look at the history in, in, in sort of early phase, what you see is that a lot of the acquisitions that are supported are actually for the Rijksmuseum because this was the sort of new national institution and this was the sort of apex of our national art. So, so that is something uh, uh, you see a lot in, in, in the early phase. Um, nowadays, you see, of course, a, a far broader range of, of acquisitions not only by, by the Rijks Museum, Maurits House, but also by smaller museums. Uh, so that is, I think, a completely different uh, um, uh, view, different approach also. Um, in our board, we have a mix of board members, mix of people, people who either have a art historical background or something completely different, for instance, a, a more of a... Uh, uh, political background or, or more of a marketing background, for instance. And I think that is, has always been and, and, and is of, of importance because it, it is something that those two, the, the combination of not only art historical uh, uh, knowledge, but also sort of more broader uh, uh, general knowledge really adds something. So, so it is a good, good mix. Um, I think it is also important to have museum directors on the board because it gives you a, a, a more active connection to, to what is happening in Dutch museums. And there is a very clear and strong procedure when uh, uh, a grant uh, or an application by, by a museum uh, uh, of one of the board members uh, is discussed. Uh, so there there is a... Uh, um, a procedure for that. Um, if it is, of course, still the case that certain works of art are uh, um, are very much uh, an addition to the collection at the Rijksmuseum, Museum, um, but nowadays far less so than than in the in the early phase. Uh, but I think, again, the Van Gooyen is a good example. It is a kind of painting that if the Rijksmuseum would uh, uh, um, do an application for this, it would not be very successful because it would not be of, of much added value. But to Reine, it is of much added value. So there's always this, this discussion. You, you Either you, you, you try to uh, uh, add something to what is in Dutch public collections as a, as a whole, but it also has to be of added value to the collection of the museum itself. And sometimes uh, it is evident that uh, it is the collection of the Rijks Museum. Sometimes it is evident it is the collection of Rene. So, so it is always something that is discussed in, in, uh, uh, by, by case. All right. Thank you very much for being here, for giving this talk. Thank, thank, you. thank you very much, every one of you, to be here. And our next one will be about the depot of the uh, Boymans van Beuningen. So everyone welcome. That's within two weeks. Bye-bye.